Good afternoon, everyone. This is the House Agriculture and Forestry Committee. I'm Representative Carolyn Partridge. It is April 27th, 2021, and it is just a couple minutes before 2 p.m. And we are taking up for discussion, kind of an ongoing discussion about agricultural housing. And as a result of some of the testimony we took last week, we had some uh, additional questions. We're expecting to be joined by Nick Richardson from the Vermont Land Trust, and um, but he has limited time. So I think what we're gonna do is kick this off with, um, with Deputy Secretary Allison Eastman and um, General Counsel for the Agency of Ag, Food and Markets, Steve Collier. Um, and so Allison, we, one of the things we were talking about last week was the quality of housing for H-2A, well, workers in general, uh, but H-2A workers. And um, we also actually had some, a little bit of curiosity. We know that you were working on what I thought was a pretty brilliant idea of trying to get workers from Puerto Rico. And uh, maybe you could give us a little bit of an update on that as well. Um, we heard mixed testimony about whether some of our undocumented workers working on dairy farms would want to be part of the H-2A program. Um, and, you know, question about whether they could. I think uh, a, a large number of those um, workers who we really appreciate, I'm just gonna say that, I sure do, uh, come from Mexico. And is there any impediment for them to potentially be part of the program? Um, but if you want to start off with a little bit about ag housing, uh, that would be fantastic. Sure. Thank you. So for the record, I'm Allison Eastman, Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Ag, Food and Markets. And uh, as the chair had referenced, um, I've had years of experience in H-2A uh, previous to coming to the agency. Um, I will answer the question on Puerto Rico. I put a lot of time and effort into uh, assisting and recruiting from Puerto Rico. And uh, much of that effort has led to non-success. I will also say that recently um, I was reached out probably uh, five or six months ago by a dairy farmer who wished to recruit workers from South Africa. And uh, we're happy to report that one of those workers uh, did arrive uh, just over a week ago onto a dairy farm here in Vermont. So as you stated, the majority of the workers in the H-2A program do come from Jamaica here to Vermont. Um, that goes back to 1942 when um, H-2A programs started to be more widely used uh, during World War, World War II. Uh, we had much of those that were operating our working landscapes um, fighting for our freedom and therefore needed to recruit migrant labor. We had a treaty with the U.S. islands um, that dated back to the 40s. That treaty was in place until 2001 after 9-11. That treaty was important. Um, it, the program ran with fluidity. Uh, the workers were not subject to having to get visas uh, to come into the United States. Since then, more convoluted, workers have to get visas, um, go for interviews at the consulates and embassies. And so still to this date, the majority of workers here in Vermont come from Jamaica, some from Mexico. And then as I stated, there's various other countries as well, most recent from Africa. Is there any other questions that you want me to touch on? We're talking farm labor housing too. Do you want me to yeah, touch on um, there was There was conversation about uh, H-2A housing and as I recall, uh, and I'm not an expert, but as I recall, there were certain requirements for the H-2A housing in terms of habitability. There's concern on the parts of some that the housing that's being provided to some of our undocumented workers is really dreadful. And so just if you could give us a little bit of a picture of what H-2A is like and then any knowledge you have of, I mean, I've heard of good situations and I've heard of bad situations and for the undocumented fellows or gals. So if you have any knowledge of any of this that you can share, that would be great. Sure. 
So as far as the H2A housing goes, it is subject to uh, housing inspections, which do occur uh, prior to a labor certification being granted by US Department of Labor. Those housing certifications are subject to one of two housing inspections. And I will preface this with saying I'm, I'm not an expert. Uh, it is the state workforce agent who conducts these housing inspections currently at Vermont Department of Labor. And uh, Steve, our general counsel is here with us today because we've been working on an MOU at the Agency of Ag with Department of Labor. And our hope is starting in May, uh, we at the Agency of Agriculture will be conducting these housing inspections through that MOU with Department of Labor. And so one of two uh, housing inspections is conducted and that's basically uh, depends on when the housing was constructed. So I believe that ETA, which uh, stands for Employment Training Administration, Migrant Housing Inspections would be any housing that was built before April 3rd of 1980. And then housing that was built after that would be subject to the OSHA uh, standards. And um, also, uh, I would say too that every, everybody who's participating in the H2A program uh, knows that we're subject to meeting the requirements under the Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Worker Protection Act. So um, I think, you know, I've mentioned H2A is interesting because these employers know that their house is subject. Father, he hasn't had one. John, can you, John, could you mute, please? Sorry about Thank that. You. Yep, thanks. So they these housing, um, in they're they're subject to the inspections, and they must pass thirty days prior to the labor certification. So that means thirty days before uh, their start date for the workers to arrive. Um, it's it's often referred to as bunk style housing. So you will hear that these workers live, there's common areas, there's their uh, bunk sleeping areas, there has to be a certain square footage um, allowance in their sleeping areas. There has to be a certain number of um, bathroom, toiletry, showers um, per worker, depending on whether it's ETA or OSHA uh, standards. And then also, you know, it, it these inspections um, do go as far as like debris or weeds or poisonous uh, plants outside of the building, as well as uh, testing the water supply. So each year the water supply is tested um, and, and must pass before the workers uh, can come on site. And in my private sector experience, we have had um, water that has not passed and, and UV treatments have had to be put in before workers arrive. Um, there's, you know, uh, they also have to have waste disposal. So oftentimes um, you'll see trash and dumpster uh, collections outside, those sort of things. But um, I believe the requirement, the space requirements uh, is 50 square foot per person in a single bed and at least 40 uh, square feet per person if using bunk beds. Um, they have to have a certain number of footage. I believe it's seven feet for ceiling height. Again, don't quote me on any of these. If you want the experts to come in, that would be Department of Labor, but they definitely look at the ceiling height. They also look at heat. If uh, these workers are here during the colder months, they have to maintain 68 degrees um, Fahrenheit for heat. Um, yeah, we went over, I was just, I made a list of myself just looking at uh, what it has. Also, if they uh, include uh, a kitchen that has utensils and uh, uh, all of their things that they need to prepare their meals free of charge as well. Food storage, refrigeration. Um, again, the refrigeration needs to at least maintain 45 degrees, um, adequate lighting and ventilation. They look at food storage shelves. Um, there's an awful lot that they look at and uh, each year when they come, you know, you may just have to replace a shelf in the kitchen, but as these, or, or put a screen door on the front that needs to be replaced, but each year that's why the inspector goes there um, to, to make sure that there's any maintenance that needs to be done, that it's done prior to the workers arriving. All right. 
Steve, is there anything you would like to add? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, well, first, I live in an old drafty Victorian, and my kids would appreciate that 68-degree rule. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I sit here shivering most of the winter days. <laughs> 68 is a tall order in this house. <laughs> Um, I, I'm, I'm really, I just came to try to answer any, any questions that anyone might have. I think, um, as, as, um, Deputy Secretary just said, we are planning on doing the H2A inspections in the new future. We'll be working with, with the Department of Labor on that. They still have an important role, but we'll be conducting the inspections themselves. I mean, obviously this is an important social and economic issue for our farms to be viable. They need to be to be run well and to have to be competitive. And we obviously want all of our workers who are so essential to all of our success to have San, um, clean and safe housing. So it's an important issue trying to find the right balance of um, financial viability and safe housing is always the question and getting enough resources to do that. The how the recent report that um, the HCB commission I thought was very helpful and informative and can help guide the conversation as we move forward. But obviously our agency has a real interest in ensuring that our farms are doing everything that they can to provide a good housing experience for all of our essential farm workers. Well, thanks, Steve. Uh, and I noticed that uh, Nick Richardson is here, so I wanna to turn to him, but I'll call on Terry first. Uh, Terry, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was just wondering, does the agency get any uh, complaints on uh, poor housing or or if they do, who do they, who are, who's complaining to you guys? Is it the workers or the farmers or passerbys or, or do they not complain? Well, and, and um, Allison may know more, but I'm not aware that we get regular complaints. I'm sure we've had some, but we're not actually the entity that would handle those complaints as it exists right now. So for H2A workers, those complaints would go to the Department of Labor because that those workers are here through a United States labor program. So, so that's why that regulation exists there. And Allison kind of touched on this before. There's an important sort of I call it a hammer, or you could also look at it as an incentive through that program, because those employers, those farmers, obviously want the workers to come. But before they can get the workers here, there's an inspection of that housing before they arrive. So there's a nice mechanism for, for the Department of Labor to be able to ensure that the housing is fit before folks come. So that's a, there's a little bit of a tool there to be able to address that housing more proactively. Other types of housing regulations would could fall to municipalities or they could fall to the Department of Public Safety, depending on where for fire safety, for example, that would fall to um, the Department of Public Safety. So we don't have a specific regulatory role for farm housing. We obviously have an interest in it. Um, but right at the, at the moment, the housing standards themselves fall within other entities, although, as, as mentioned, we will be inspecting H2A housing uh, in the near future. Uh, are the uh, uh, the Mexican workers on the dairy farms is that considered H2A or is the is this the Jamaican workers? So I, I would say that we do have some workers that are on dairy farms under the H2A program. So we can't specifically state. Um, that all workers are or are not on the H-2A program through dairy. Um, I know of at least two farms in Vermont that are dairy that do access the H-2A program. Oh, okay. Good to and know. I, I, I just didn't realize that they ever were inspected like, uh, like the Jamaican workers. I, I mean, I know a lot about the Jamaican workers from living in Shoreham, but uh, I didn't realize that the uh, dairy farms were inspected also. I think it's important too to note that the housing for the H-2A program is very different than the housing for non-H-2A. So the H-2A program, the workers travel themselves. They don't travel with family. There's no children, no spouse. 
And so oftentimes that's why it's referred to as bunk style housing, multi-workers living within one area, one building um, with common areas. Uh, whereas um, other migrant farm workers or U.S. domestic workers, when they have housing provided, would be looking for a house uh, potentially for their family. And then we, the only housing complaints that I'm aware of that we received at the agency are really, um, they, they don't point to a particular employer. They will say that the housing is substandard on a farm in you know, the Northeast Kingdom, but we never get particulars. And so recently, Steve um, and, and I exchanged some emails with Department of Labor to figure out, like, what could we put forward as far as housing complaints and, and uh, procedures for people to follow uh, should they wish to report a complaint of that nature? And, yeah, that, and if I, I'm, oh, I'm that sorry. would be great. No, go ahead, Steve. Well, and I, I was just going to add to Representative Norris's question that one of the, I think one of the real challenges here is that with people who are undocumented, there's a real reticence to bring forward complaints to the government period, no matter who the regulatory agency is, because they, they obviously are concerned about a risk of being reported to the federal government and, and not that the state, I'm not saying the state would do that, but they're just are worried about coming forward period. So no matter who serves that role, in terms of regulating, there's a there's a difficulty in reaching those folks, and because they they're making sometimes a cost benefit analysis, and and sometimes it's an informed one, and sometimes it's not. But there is always some challenges, I think, in reaching people that aren't documented um, because of that um, kind of corollary concern about what the ramifications may be of any kind of report to any sort of governmental agency, whether those concerns are valid or not. I think that they're real and are there. <clears throat> so John, I see your hand up, but I know that Nick is under a time crunch. And so what I'd like to do is turn to Nick and um, ask those questions. And then maybe you could hold your questions because I think we have Allison and Steve till 3.30 uh, as we do Liz. Um, Nick, thanks so much for joining us. Um, <clears throat> as we're talking about agricultural housing or agriculture uh, housing for agricultural workers, uh, one of the things that came up last week was the concept that, um, you know, we're trying to figure out ways that potentially better housing could be constructed for some of these workers. And um, we know that frequently if a, if a farm is conserved, there are certain requirements, restrictions put on them in terms of building, you know, any kind of development. And so this is one of the reasons we invited uh, Liz and Gus Selig as well to just to, to talk about some of the, I don't know if they're covenants or what, what, what you know, agreements that, um, and, and wonder what it would take. First of all, is it possible to, to do housing under current agreements or would it be possible to potentially change the, um, change the agreement so that housing for ag workers could be included. Great, thank you, Representative Partridge. Um, it's great to be with you all and I appreciate the chance to come in and testify. Um, just, I guess for the record, I'm Nick Richardson, the president and CEO of the Vermont Land Trust. And um, we're here to offer some insight and perspective on that question and on the report in general that VHCB commissioned and um, was, was just recently released. Um, so I'll just say a couple of things at the top around the overall report and then focus in on your question. Um, and I'm grinning because I, I took a short detour trip to South Wyndham uh, over the weekend and stopped in at Bill and Betsy's house. That didn't, I, I wasn't there long enough to come say hi, but we, we did, uh, we were there on a, on a late on Friday afternoon. Um, so, I mean, first of all, I just want to say this report is an excellent report. Um, I think it's comprehensive. I think it does a really good job of painting the picture of the issues around access to affordable housing and the impact that that has for farmers and for farm workers in Vermont it is a really big deal. And um, we've seen over the course of the last few years that this question of housing um, and how can we affordably house the people who work on and own our farms has really risen 
to become one of the most significant issues facing agriculture today. So it is a, it's a core viability issue. Uh, I'm sure that, uh, that um, the folks at the Agency of Agriculture um, and uh, the Deputy Secretary Eastman would agree with me um, that these, these challenges are being borne by farmers, by the communities around them, um, and that uh, it's time to really think about what are some of the solutions that, that we could put in place uh, to address the affordable housing issues that are specific to agriculture and to farming. Um, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's quite clear that Vermont has an affordable housing issue. Um, and the ag landscape is not immune from that set of questions. Um, so it's great that we're taking the time to focus on that. Um, the, the specifics in the report around the conservation easements and the impact of conservation easements, I think are very important to raise. And I'm really glad that um, the question of how easements and current use and other restrictions impact the ability to um, develop housing are brought forward and, and named in the report as something to be aware of and put some focus and attention to. Um, I, I do think it's important to um, just offer a perspective on the, op the option to purchase an agricultural value and the role of uh, conservation easements as it relates to farm labor housing and the ability to build housing on farms. Uh, because in the specifics and the details of those easements, in almost every case, um, there's a there's a right um, to build farm labor housing that's included on the agricultural easements that are done in Vermont, um, and that's been true for a long time. It's actually now a requirement of the federal program, the ASIP Ale program, that we use to fund a portion of those easements. But um, the the access to the right to build housing that is for um, that is designated for farm labor exists on almost every agricultural easement in Vermont. Um, there is a discretion right um, that the land trust and or the Vermont Housing Conservation Board and the Ag Agency have around where that housing gets built and the shape of it. But um, it's a provision that is in the easement. It's contemplated in the design that we want to create the opportunity for housing to be built consistent with the supporting the existing ag operations. Um, so, so just on can it be done through an easement and is, is the easement a barrier? I would say the easement has something to say about housing, um, but also creates a pathway for, for creating housing on farms that's consistent with the purposes of, of housing farm labor. Um, and we, it's not something that, I'm, I'm sure that there are additional complexities associated with doing that, the, doing the development of farm labor housing when you're talking about current use in particular, and maybe in terms of conservation as well. Um, but it's not a barrier to getting that done. And so I just wanted to like clarify that. Um, the, the, the other point um, is related to the option to purchase at agricultural value. And that, believe it or not, is even more complicated. Um, you know, the option to purchase at agricultural value is a really important tool for keeping farmland and, and forest land and working farms affordable. Um, and what it does is it pegs the value, that it creates the option to purchase at agricultural value for the Vermont Land Trust and for our partners at VHCB and the Agency of Agriculture, essentially um, encouraging the transaction of that land at its agricultural value as opposed to at an inflated value where a non-farming landowner or um, or a person might come in and purchase that land and, and not build another house on it, but also not farm on it either. We wanted to try and the intent of that OPAV is to keep farmland farming. Um, one of the ways in which that can create challenges related to housing is when you invest in housing on land that has an option to purchase at agricultural value on it. Um, the option to purchase at agricultural value only values that new construction at the um, at its appraised value, right? Um, at the value that it's worth in the market. Um, and the, pr the problem that that can potentially create is if you've just constructed that housing, it's going to be more expensive to construct it in Vermont um, than it's worth according to appraisal. And that's a challenge that that, that issue called negative equity is something that we face all across 
but um, the sort of issues related to housing and to commercial construction here in Vermont, that it costs more to build buildings in Vermont than they're initially worth according to appraisal. Um, and that is a very, there's a very complicated set of factors behind that. Um, you know, one of them is that the costs of construction materials right now are sky high. I think everybody knows this when you go, you know, try and, um, you know, get a contractor to work on your house, or if you're trying to, you know, build a garage, or you're just even trying to get some concrete, everything's a lot more expensive because of the disruptions and supply chains that have come about as a result of COVID. Um, and the other challenges associated with um, getting construction done in this environment right now. So, um, it's, you know, and also I would say probably because there's more demand for construction services in Vermont as more people look to move here and buy houses here. So there, there are a lot of factors that are pushing that negative equity issue. And, you know, I think it's a real challenge and concern. I don't, I don't think it's um, limited to OPAV restricted properties, um, but the OPAV kind of really shines a light on the challenge of that negative e equity issue. And it, I think you know, certainly over the short term and in individual cases, having an OPAB on a farm where you've just built new infrastructure, new buildings can result in the wiping out of some of the equity and value in those buildings. So it's an issue, something that we're taking a look at. Um, we're working closely with partners like VHCB to think about how to address that. And in some cases, what we're trying to do is design new conservation easements going forward. So they leave the house site out or a, you know a housing opportunity outside of the envelope of the of the conservation easement, and have it be part of the parcel but separate from the conservation the conservation easement. So the OPAV would not apply to you know a building envelope. It's very it's something that we're you know it's a I think it's a piece of learning and it's it's something that we're um, experimenting with carefully with partners, um, and I think it, in a large part because we're aware of the fact that in some cases this negative equity issue can get created. But I don't think, uh, I don't think that it is the, I, th I don't think the OPAV is the driving issue, the driving force be or factor behind the issue. I think the issue is it's very expensive to build houses in Vermont and they don't end up being worth as much once you build them um, <laughs> than the cost of the materials and the effort is right now. And that's something we all kind of work, work with and face here, so. Um, that's that's kind of my opening. I think um, you know we we're we can stay very committed to working on these issues. We're helping to support um, the development of a significant amount of farm housing related to the Eau Claire project that folks may be familiar with. Um, you know, working to do significant dense farmer develop farmer housing development as we also conserve a, a significant amount of that land. Um, been working very closely with VHCB and um, with Gus and his team to, to think about how we design for that, that need and try to address that, that issue as a part of this larger conservation project. And I'm excited to see other opportunities like that come along. If we can identify places where there's demand for farm labor housing in an area, we can be working with our partners on the housing side to put conservation and housing side by side. And I'm excited to do more of that uh, in the years to come. Uh, I think I'll leave it there. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions folks have. Great, Nick, thanks so much. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, John, you had your hand up. Do you want to ask a question now or um, we'll turn to Liz? Well, let's let Liz go. And if anybody has questions specifically for Nick too, they can go. Okay, great. All right. Um, all right, so this is helpful. So we're, we're understanding that in any of these uh, conservation easements, you do have the right to build uh, farm labor housing. So that's good news. Um, the question is, is it ultimately worth it? Because it, yeah, okay. It's, well, I think, I think the question is, in, the question is, is it worth it? Or, or um, really that there's, there can be these instances um, where, the cost of building is higher than the initial value of that housing to the property, and that can create an issue for folks. Right. So, so if you if you wanted to turn around and sell, right. But if you've if you've bought it at agricultural value, then you have to agree, I would assume, to sell at agricultural value. That's right. And that might not take into consideration the actual cost of building that housing. 
Yeah, and it, it may like, it will probably like, it would likely eventually catch up to it, but it would take some time for that to happen. So particularly in a situation, what you were saying, where if you, if you, if you purchase an OPAV restricted property, you then built some housing on it that was farm labor housing consistent with the easement. And then for some reason needed to, or decided to sell that property within the first few years, you would likely have, you know, be taking a hit on the financials in part because of the OPAV being in place. Right. So it would only make sense to build that housing if you planned on holding on to it for a while. Long time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right. Liz, um, Nick talked about the, the uh, housing report that you all did, and we heard some talk about it last week as well. Um, and thank you for doing that. Um, is there anything, you've heard some of the questions and some of the line of, of, of um, thought. And so is there anything you wanna to add to this conversation? Sure, yes, thank you so much. Um, I'm Liz Gleason with BHCB's Farm and Forest Viability Program. And I can speak a little bit to um, some of my impressions from that report, but I did wanna specifically respond to two of the things that have come up. Um, First, starting with this question around, you know, when does it make sense to build housing on OPEV farms? I think for many people, it's um, it's less of a question of how long will I be, be here and will it pay off? And more of a question of will a lender lend me the money that I need because the appraisals are conducted by lenders in these cases and, um, and it's really, a um, that's a big decision-making point where a lot of people can get, um, you know, not be able to move forward because they can't access loans in order to build. Um, and we know that generally agricultural businesses um, are low margin and have very fluctuating cash flow. And so that combined with the appraisals in these cases can just make it um, a barrier to access a loan. Um, and then I wanted to go back to something at the beginning really quickly, just to clarify the um, how farm housing gets inspected. I think there's, there's three really distinct bucket areas that we're talking about here. There's the fact that any housing that you're providing to workers is technically qualifies as rental housing and is therefore subject to Vermont's housing laws. Um, we have a you know, a system in place where those are inspected locally. And what we heard last week was, um, and what we know to be true is that generally there's not capacity to actually do those inspections. So the vast majority of on-farm rental housing, whether folks are paying rent or it's just included in their job um, are not inspected by anyone. Um, H2A has its own inspection program that's very focused just on those farms and those are, um, generally, but not always sort of vegetable and produce farms because H2A is designed to be a seasonal program. Um, and I don't know, I think, I definitely am not the expert here, but there's probably about 80 to 100 farms in Vermont that use H2A as a program. Um, maybe Steve or Allison wanna jump in at some point on that. And then the third bucket area is what we heard a lot about last week, which is the Milk with Dignity program, which set up its own um, inspection system that looks at a bunch of different things, including whether or not farms who are part of that program meet the basic rental housing code. Um, and I believe what Milk with Dignity shared last week was that's about 100 farms too, um, but I'm not totally sure on that. So overall, like we know that most on-farm housing is not currently getting inspected. Um, but that okay. there are robust systems for some of them. And Allison, is that how many farms uh, approximately do we have with H2A workers? Roughly 40. That was way okay. 35 to 40. And um, the report um, states 650 workers. <clears throat> um, petition for what I think is important to understand is some of those workers are already here picking um, apples and then they transfer to a packing job order. They're gonna live in the same housing that they were in when they were picking. 
So though it's, it's a separate job order, um, there is some duplicative uh, nature in that reporting. So there's roughly 400 and we say 350, 400 workers per year that come in through H2A. The report says 650. Okay, so so actually there are fewer workers. They're just spread over a number of different jobs. I think we're counting the same worker a couple of times, right? They pick yeah. apple and then they yeah. stay to pack. And so when the packing <laughs> job order goes through, I think how the... Um, the report, the author of the report was using the number of petitions that were filed. And so a petition would file for packers of workers who are already here picking and they just transfer to pack. Same worker, same housing. Okay. And um, I know some farms, uh, like diversified vegetable farms, um, have H2A workers. Is it possible that an H2A worker could work that and, and I get that, you know, frequently with these farms, they're root crops, and so they might be there until October, November. But is it possible for uh, a farmer who's going to, uh, a, a worker who's going to work at one of these farms doing vegetables to then transfer to another farm where there's they're doing turkeys, let's say, uh, to fill out the full ten months? Yeah, so a worker can be here for up to three years. They can only work for the employer for 10 months. It's the employer that defines the seasonal temporary need. So some of these workers are here over a 10 month period. Uh, it's not the worker who, who defines the seasonal temporary need. So they do, they come here, they pick, they pack, they prune, and then they go to turkeys. Um, some of them transfer for maple. It depends on uh, what the ask is, but there's a, um, there's workers that have been coming here, some of them for 35, 40 years, and they do pick apples and uh, then they transfer to the turkey farms uh, in the fall. Right, now you said that they could be here for three years. Is that three years without going back to where they came from? Mm -hmm. That's how the H2A visa works. So, so, then, so is that how are the dairy workers are being here? They can only be here for 10 months for one employer. And so it is customary that the majority of them do return after that 10 month period. Some are here for only four to six months, some for mm -hmm. six or eight weeks if they're just picking apples. Uh, so it varies depending on the workers. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, uh, John, do you wanna ask your question now? Sure, thanks, Carolyn. I I just wonder, maybe this is for Allison and Steve, but what, what obligation are, are, I guess it's going to be mostly our, our bigger dairy farms, what obligation are they under to, to document who they have working for them? Whether it's migrants or, or anybody, really. And just how those, and even how those deals work, like housing so often is part of it, um, you know, is minimum wage part of it, or are they just you know, a hundred different deals for a hundred different farms. Allison, is oh, that your bailiwick? Loaded question, <laughs> Representative O'Brien. Um, I don't know the answer, so it's not really loaded. Just, just curious. Yeah, so I think to answer you, um, boy, I'm going to feel like a politician when I give you this answer, though. Um, <laughs> I'm, I, I would Join probably be better off letting Steve take it, but you know, there are laws on the books, right? We have the Migrant Seasonal Protection Act. We have Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, we have federal and state laws. And so in my experience uh, with US Department of Labor and some of this is private sector experience before I came to the agency and some of these um, investigations, they would call them as they pertain to labor, they look at almost everything that you just um, stated in your question. So they would look at a worker, how many hours they're working. Um, if they are truly doing agricultural work, uh, specifically those that are here on an ag visa, even if they're not here on an ag visa, if they're working for an agricultural employer, and um, they, I'll give you an example where I think we in Vermont have seen some employers um, walk into some wage and hour violations, but we continue to see our farms diversify. And so when they're working under agriculture, um, we all understand that ag is exempt from paying overtime. If that same worker then crosses over to baked pies or sliced apples 
or now they're going to make cheeses and make yogurts and they've worked 50 hours picking apples or milking cows and now they're going to tack on another 20 hours of baking pies or making cheeses they're subject to overtime if they're no longer doing agricultural employment so it's very important that we look at the differences of manufacturing and agriculture so without you know jumping into specifics um, that'll just give you a brief overview that yes, they're subject to those laws and depending on the situation and a complaint or um, an investigator showing up, they would be subject to making sure that they're meeting and following those laws. How'd I do Steve? We'll look to the lawyer. I can add a little bit. I, I think Representative O'Brien, you also asked about what the arrangements were around housing. And I think the answer is it's all over the place. Um, in a you know a handful of scenarios, there's perhaps a written release, written lease. In many, it's more of a verbal agreement, um, and it really differs by the farm. Um, again, those are still those situations are still subject to sort of renter rights, um, and uh, you know whether or not there's um, a financial exchange there. In the uh, investigations that I have seen, they take the housing, if there's not a written agreement on an amount and what it's worth, they look at the fair market value, the number of workers who are living in it. And that's how they assess how much it's worth towards their total earnings package. Whether they have their family here or not, does that come into it? Yeah, I'm not certain. I mean, we could definitely check in on that. I know that the wage and hour investigator that I've worked with, they just stated fair market value. So um, I'm assuming that that's based on what it's worth for the employee, regardless of who's living there. If there was really um, deplorable conditions, is there some way that the farmer's feet can be held to the fire. I mean, we, we realize farmers are struggling and they're probably doing the best they can, but if the conditions are really, really horrible, and we've heard some stories uh, in particular from migrant justice about, about some of these conditions, is there something these workers can do in terms of, you know, they probably don't want to call law enforcement or the Department of Labor, um, but, is there any recourse for them? Um, I, I'm not sure I can answer that specifically, um, but I do know that Migrant Justice and Milk with Dignity have a really excellent pamphlet on workers' rights that lays out some of the pathways that people can take. And that organization, you know, specifically is founded with a really strong mission around helping people in situations like that. Um, I can't really speak to situations where people either aren't part of the Milk with Dignity program in which there is a recourse, um, should that business be inspected and not be able to work with the organization to make changes. What we heard last week was that Milk with Dignity is really interested in identifying challenges and working with the farmer to solve them so they can continue you know, shipping milk to Ben and Jerry's, which is the why this the, the agreement under which they operate is that they sell to Ben and Jerry's and meet these requirements. Um, but I don't know if, if anyone else can speak to folks that aren't under that program and um, how local municipalities handle this. If I may. Yeah, Steve, go ahead. Sure. Well, I think there's an important distinction that all of the state's mm -hmm. laws apply to folks who are here undocumented. So in other words, a farmer can't violate the housing laws or the employment laws or any sort of law simply because someone's undocumented. I think where the problem arises is that undocumented workers are concerned about reporting violations. They certainly can. The state wants them to report. It's not that's not the state's position in any way that undocumented workers or have any fewer rights than anyone else in terms of the enforcement of these laws. It's just that because of the precarious position that 
some of these folks are in, they're reluctant to do so. And whether that reluctance is warranted or not is a whole different question. And sometimes it may be because even if the state does everything absolutely appropriately and handles the violation, there's nothing that stops a farmer or a neighbor or someone else from reporting the, the person to the federal government, um, to ICE. So, and that might be retaliation and that might be illegal, but, but there's still, you know, there's a difficult, it's, it's difficult when you do not have the fundamental legal documentation to be here at all to, to perhaps to worry about your individual other rights um, that may be being violated. And the state certainly wants to enforce those laws, but we also understand that people that are in that position are vulnerable and, and they may be making difficult judgment calls. So every law that exists, in my opinion, at least, and there may be some discrete exceptions, but for the most part, they apply to everyone. It's just the access to those legal rights is, can be much more difficult to, to achieve. Right, right. Vicki, you've been so patient. Your hand is up, go ahead. No, well, thank you. And I am trying to understand <clears throat> the process that when these folks come in and are helping either seasonally or uh, on dairy farms, you know, for months at a time, who's, who's basically responsible for keeping track of sometimes to say 10 months, six months, a year, two years, that at length of time can get lost in the shuffle. Who's keeping track of how long an individual might be here and when they actually, the day they have to leave, when they fulfilled that time, how does that work? That sounds confusing and a bit difficult to me. I'll take that question if you please. Allison. So I think we're referring to those that are here under the visa programs, Representative Strong, they come in and they're approved for a period of employment at a particular employer. And so as mentioned before, if there's a worker who wishes to transfer from an apple orchard to turkeys, they have what's called an I-94, as well as their work visa. And so the I-94 has their um, completion date of their current contract that's approved under immigration and US Department of Labor, as well as in their passport, their uh, work visa would have that same date stamped. And so the workers know that they need to be out by that date. These employers that utilize these programs are very familiar that the end date of their job order is the end date of the I-94. So even if they had additional work, they need to petition to keep the workers here. Should they wish to go past that date um, and get new I-94 cards and uh, updated documentation for those workers? When a worker uh, arrives and um, they then are getting added to payroll. They complete an I-9 and W-4s just like we would. If you look at an I-9, it says authorized to work until, and that's a section that we don't normally fill out because we're U.S. domestic, U.S. citizens. But if you were here on a work visa, um, that would be completed by your employer. And so in their um, employee uh, documentation for each worker, they would know what the end date is. And when the worker transfers to the next farm, if they go to turkeys, they will get an updated I-94 card that'll show the, the new extension date for the new employer. They usually have agents as well that have worked. Some employers petition for the workers themselves. Um, a good portion of them do work with agents. And so the agents will remind the employer that their end date is starting up and we need to arrange for departure transportation. Thank you. Do, is, um, does anyone help provide money for the transportation issues? Under the H-2A program, transportation must be provided and paid for by the employer. All right, Vicki, are you all set? Good to go, thank you. Good. Terry, go ahead. Uh, as far as uh, the uh, workers that are unsatisfied or whatever, but I've been out of farming for probably 12, 12 years now, I think, or 13, but I recall back in my day, the um, undocumented workers, the, there was a lady, I don't remember her name, she had like, I don't know, grandma something or rather, but she was like a an overseer and you know, because these people don't just pop in from Mexico and, you know, and oh yeah, they're they're here on your farm. You know, they don't 
that's not how it kind of works. I mean, they they have this kind of a network of, uh, you know, she kind of takes care of them, watches out for them, whatever. But uh, so if they were dissatisfied working on this farm in Shoreham, she could swap them out and they'll be working on a farm in Bridport the next day. I mean, that's the way it used to be. I don't know if it's still that same way, but uh, it's not like they're here without any uh, supervision or, or even when they're undocumented, they're, they, they have a kind of a network of people that watch out for everybody and make things happen. I could be wrong. Sometimes I dream things up. So, <laughs> so Terry, for instance, if if uh, in that situation that you describe, uh, and uh, you know, I, I have no reason not to believe you. Um, if if the housing situation was terrible, you know, if there were rats and or they were living in a closet off the milk room or whatever we heard the other day, um, would that? Yeah. Um, Granny so and so would she intervene with the farmer to say you got to shape up here or, or you're losing your worker? I think she would. Yes, I mean she's she. They called her. You know, it wasn't the Grammy. I think she was Mama or Mother, Mother something or other. But uh, she was. That's exactly what she did. I'm. I think I met her once or twice because. Uh, we were kind of newbies in that whole thing because we just decided that hey, before we got done, we wanted to have a Hispanic worker. So, so we looked into it, but uh, she was, you know, she just like a, a mother hen. She watched out for everybody. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Actually, I think I know where that farm is that you talk about, but uh, I mean, my wife does. She knows a lot more about the stuff that I even imagined, but, uh, you know, we know those, the farm that you're talking about with the, with the little, uh, housing off the, of the milk house, but I mean, they had a kitchenette and whatever. So. Yeah. Well, Probably we won't not, mention not any ideal. names here. <laughs> no, no, I, I won't, but, uh, yeah, I think that's, you know, I think that's <laughs> the way it used to be was that, this had a network of uh, people that knew somebody and, you know, and if, cause you know, sometimes they, you know, if they get scared and worried, they just kind of, you know, the next morning they're gone. They've gone mm -hmm. back to Mexico or whatever. I mean, when I was working on the ferry one morning, there were like nine of them in New York waiting to swim across the, the lake. I mean, we brought them over on the ferry and they, they had a cousin that worked on a farm over here or something, you know, and I don't know. It's just a, it's, I don't know. It's a very kind of um, a workable network of people. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. it is, maybe it's not the best thing that goes on, but it goes on. It's like a, the underground, I guess. Right. Right. Yes. I thought I was thinking that exact word. Um, so do, does anybody know if that person is still, that woman is still performing that function for these workers? I mean, you know. I don't, I don't know, but. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, this is probably something. And maybe my, migrant justice is trying to fulfill some of those needs at this point too. But um Anyway, I, I, you've painted a good picture, Terry, <laughs> in terms of what it all looks like. Um, just, just take it for with a grain of salt because it's been a, been a long time. Yeah, and it's also I, interesting to me. I've, I've referenced this book that I read. I just returned it to the library called "On the Plane of Snakes," and uh, it, which is by Paul Theroux, and he talks about. Uh, all of these workers that are trying to make it up from Guatemala in particular, um, walking thousands of miles through Mexico, all of the trials and tribulations they're having. And, and I mean, it's pretty impressive that these people actually make it, but then let's say they want to head back to Mexico. What happens then? You know, 
they probably don't exactly get on a bus and go, I don't know. Anyway, I'm not expecting anybody from the agency to answer these questions. <laughs> but anyway, um, I noticed that um, Gus has joined us. And Gus, thank you so much for, for being a part of this today. One of our questions, which I think we've had answered by Nick Richardson and, and Liz and others have been doing a great job is, you know, what about, uh, I was calling the covenant, it's a conservation easement and would that allow for the construction of, of worker housing if we were trying to improve the lot of some folks that are working at our farms, we do appreciate their work. And, um, and we understand some of the, the, um, the problems, including the concept of negative equity. So for, was, that, was that the term? Um, anyway, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, it's negative equity, but um, you know, we were we were have just been taking testimony, and House General Housing and Military Affairs is looking at housing, and and would you know, are there ways to provide better housing for in some of these cases where we know the, um, the housing is pretty deplorable? Um, okay, so um, well, I I can try to address that and talk a little bit about why we did the study, uh, if that would be helpful, Madam Chair. Sure. Go okay. right ahead. Okay, so for the record, I'm Gus Selig. I'm the director for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And um, we undertook the study that um, John Ryan delivered last week um, and that you heard about in your joint meeting because we knew that there were issues on farms. And um, what I told your colleagues in the other body some weeks ago, uh, based on the governor's recommend at the beginning of the session of a large amount of one-time funding, and based upon the report John gave us uh, that said, you know, a small repair program would go a long way to addressing these issues is that we'll take at least a half million dollars from the monies the governor's proposed, assuming the legislature agrees and set up that repair program um, and make it available to farmers who want to make minor repairs. We did meet with uh, Milk with Dignity and Migrant Justice about two weeks ago now, um, and they have a proposal to actually, this is another part of John's recommendations, to do some replacement housing um, uh, that would improve quality. And they outlined a proposal that they want to make to us. They've been out doing some fundraising, and they want to ultimately take a home a modular home that would cost over $200,000 and bring it down to about $120,000 cost to farmers. It would be a what's called a zero energy modular home. Uh, so made in a factory, but with a solar package would not consume any, any, any energy. And we're gonna take a look at that as a possible pilot project to try to fund. Um, so I, I think that's how we're gonna start on this issue. Um, one of the things that John said in his report that I think is important to note is because um, a significant part of the farm labor force is not here with full legal status, it's awfully hard to use federal funds um, for those folks. So when I was visiting with uh, your colleagues in the other body, uh, there was a thought that there was lots of federal money to, to leverage. and. That might true, be true for some, some of the folks who work on our farms, but also not true for others. And just makes, from my perspective, it really important to, for there to be state funding that's far more flexible than the federal funding is. So I'm really appreciative of the governor's recommend for one-time funding and your colleagues in the Appropriations Committee actually took his recommendation and doubled it. And now he's made a major proposal himself uh, to invest ARPA funding into housing. So I think in the coming year or two, we're going to have some resources to help address the issue. And that's what we plan to do um, for anybody who wants to, wants to work on this issue. Great, Gus. Thank you so much. Um, that's, that's pretty cool, the, the um, modular housing. Yeah. Um, and you say that uh, it, it, the value is two hundred thousand dollars, but potentially we could bring it down to one hundred and twenty. 
that's their goal. So they're asking us for some funding to help bring that cost down so that it's more affordable for a farmer. And, you know, you folks had your own discussion in the joint hearing, and it's quite true that the, particularly in the dairy industry, but dairy is not alone, that the economics of agriculture have been so rugged um, over the last several years that uh, there are farmers who may want to improve the quality of their housing and other infrastructure they have but they're under the gun to make water quality improvements they're under the gun just based on cash flow so bringing the cost down is is one of the ways that we can i, I think get to a place that we'd like to be and gus is it envisioned that that house um would um house multiple workers as um as Allison was describing for the H2A workers sort of bunk style, or would it be for a family that works on the farm? Um, we, haven't gotten, we haven't gotten a specific proposal, but I think it's gonna be a mix. And I, my understanding of what the report tells us is most of the workers are single adults who are here on their own, not with their families. Mm -hmm. And so, but one of the issues was, you know, do people have their own, own bedrooms? are the cooking facilities and the bathroom facilities sufficient? So it would be to address, people could be living in that style and, but there also could be families that are being housed. That seems to be a much lower percentage of the overall population at this point. Yeah, and as Allison described, the H2A workers come by themselves. They do not bring families. Right. Um, but it also seems to me that the H2A housing uh, is inspected and there are certain requirements that need to be met, whereas the problem really lies with um, undocumented workers who frequently do bring their family, or I shouldn't say frequently because I don't know, but they sometimes bring their families and the conditions are potentially much worse. So yeah. I, my understanding of John's report, and Liz can correct me, is that most people who are coming are not bringing families. Um, Necessarily, there there are some, but that's not by any means the majority, mm -hmm. H two A or not. Um, so you know, I, I think I, I should also just back up and say housing quality is not just a problem in the agricultural landscape. Um, I've worked with Representative Strong and a nonprofit she's been affiliated with, and they've taken on lots of housing that was owned by private individuals in the Northeast Kingdom that really hadn't been invested in in many years and fixed it up. I think we were together up in Derby Line about a year ago for a building right in the center of the community that had been turned from not terrific housing into good housing. And again, owners sometimes get themselves to a place where they're cash strapped and don't have the means to invest. What Vermont has never had, whether for anybody, um, is an inspection program for rental housing. We leave it up to town health officers uh, to do the enforcement. Um, and I think that there's a proposal in the legislature now to actually begin to create some capacity um, to inspect our rental housing. So this is not an issue that's exclusive to the farm community at all in terms of housing quality. And it, it goes to the very difficult nature of what can rental property bring in for dollars? Who's the owner? And are they in a position to reinvest? And uh, it, it, it plays out in a different way in the ag sector because you also have an employer-employee relationship um, and your, your, your tenancy is tied to your employment, uh, which makes things more complicated. Right, right. Yeah, I think we talked about that in caucus today. I think it's S79 maybe, mm -hmm. which will yep. require a rental registry. Um, yep. So, um, good. Uh, I'm wondering if you have anything to add, Gus, or if anyone has questions for any of our our witnesses today. I'm happy to take questions, uh, but we will get a program started in the coming year, and I hope that will be a help to the farm community, both to the employees and the employers. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks so much for all your work on that. Um, any other, any questions? Gosh, I'm losing members here. They're just disappearing. There's still four of us, thank goodness. 
Um, <laughs> um, I, internet apparently is not very good in certain places of the state today. <laughs> so, um, and um, poor Rodney's church burned down last oh, night. So um, it, really tragic. I was talking to him earlier. He was up through the night, like got called at 1.30 and then had to go down at 2.30 because the uh, the clock was actually owned by the town and he's chair of the select board. So I, I feel terrible. I, that building was uh, built in 1775, he told me. And, um, you know, if our meeting house, which was built in 1802, got, got on fire, I would just be devastated. So I'm really thinking about him a lot today. Yeah, so that's tragic. Yeah. What a loss. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently it was some electrical problem anyway, or they're looking at that. So uh, any other questions, committee members, those of you who have hung in here, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. I think that's it. Um, committee tomorrow. Um, we have, see you Gus, I know you got to go and thank you, Liz. Thank you, Steve. Thanks to Allison. Um, we have S 102, um, and Mike O'Grady is going to come at eight 30 tomorrow. Sorry, gang, but eight 30 is the only time he's available. So Linda will be sending you an invitation for, uh, eight 30 in the morning. And then we'll go from there. I, I don't even know what's on the rest of our agenda. Hold on. Yes. Oh, tomorrow, forestry issues. That'll be interesting. Colleen Goodrich is going to be here. Um, she, she's in Albany, right, Mickey Goodrich? Yeah. She, yeah she's, been a, she's been a good friend for 30 years. <laughs> yeah, she's so nice. I love her. Um, so Christy Colton will be here. Ed Larson's on the agenda, but he has said he just wants to be here because they're his, his clients. He doesn't necessarily want to say anything. Uh, and then Michael Snyder will be, and we'll be talking about that language that we had entertained him. By the way, does anybody know what happened to that amendment um, that Lucy Rogers offered? Yeah, um, you know, I was going to email you about it, Carolyn, just that it was exactly what we have been talking about, as far as yeah. my understanding was. So yeah. I just, I actually at the end th thanked her, they, she withdrew it. But I, I just said thank you for the amendment and the Ag Committee has been dealing with that particular issue. We're hoping to address it and come up with something. And I encouraged her to be in touch with us. So good. Perfect. I hope, I hope that was okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that's perfect. Um, okay. She had called me the night before. And oh. I explained to her that we were working on it and that, uh, you know, we would love to see something happen. But we also got that it's um, uh, natural resources, fish and wildlife sort of you know, to Act 250 is sort of their purview, uh, but that uh, we were hoping that at some point, you know, we could get something through. It might not be till next year, but uh, even if we worked on it and did some good work, they might find our work valuable. So, um, and then she said, well, I'll, um, you know, I'll present it and depending on what their take is, uh, I'll, I'll maybe withdraw it. So, I, I just didn't know what ended up happening with it. I but. knew that you had, you were on your webinar. <laughs> yes, so I was. I, I knew you weren't there and available to maybe explain what the committee was doing. And I didn't go into any detail, but I, I just wanted to assure everyone it's something we're thinking about and working on. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up, Vicki. Yeah, I'm really glad you did. All right, uh, any other questions now for anybody, uh, Terry? Well, I noticed that tomorrow at uh, 10 30 or 10 o'clock, we're going to have Jackie Poulsen. And I just wanted to give you a heads up that uh, the Senate added, uh, a probes added 500,000 to the fares. And if we could uh, encourage House of Probes to accept that, that would be. Awesome for the fairs. So just a, a heads up. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Terry. Yeah, I don't I don't know exactly. You know, that'll probably be something they duke out in um in committee of conference. Yeah. Um is that in the budget or is it in H three fifteen or
Oh, uh, 315's in ball in, already. Sorry. Yeah, it's in the big budget. Okay. Well, maybe we want to talk individually with members of our probes. Yeah, that was the suggestion of the fair people. Yeah. <laughs> if, we, if we knew anybody on a probes that might uh, <laughs> yeah. have a favorable opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we can reach out to our friends there. Um, all right. Anything else that you want to talk about right now? All right. Well, listen, everybody, thank you so much. Thanks for hanging in there. And uh, hopefully tomorrow will be a better day in terms of, uh, I know Rodney will be back. And, um, and in terms of internet connections, that, let's keep our fingers crossed. So uh, with that, we'll see you at nine. Well, we'll see you at eight.